together for you all to uh, use as you work with consumers that may be encountering issues uh, as it comes to eligibility for health insurance uh, who are from the immigrant community. And please know that this session will talk a lot about eligibility regarding immigration status, but it will also um, it will also talk about the different programs that folks might be eligible for. I want to make sure that this presentation is useful for you. And if there's things that we do not cover, please don't hesitate to give me um, your feedback. Uh, we will have an evaluation that will be sent to you via email, as well as mentioned at the end of the session. And those evaluations mean the world to making these presentations better, uh, helpful to you, and making sure that we're covering information that you want to see. My name is Caroline Gomez-Tom. I'm the project manager uh, of the Milwaukee Enrollment Network, as well as the program manager of Covering Wisconsin's Navigator Program. Today, uh, we'll be talking about immigration status as it pertains to eligibility rules, particularly for the health insurance marketplace as well as Wisconsin Medicaid programs. Um, we will not discuss other areas of eligibility, so please know that uh, when we're talking about this person may be eligible, I am not, uh, the reason I'm using the word may is because we're not talking about income, we're not talking about no other non-financial eligibility factors, uh, we're not talking about particularly um, household size versus uh, modified adjusted gross income. This is really specific to immigration status, and there are so many other factors that may make that person eligible or not. So please know that this is not a steadfast rule. This is um, a conversation about what common immigration statuses would allow someone to uh, qualify for if everything else kind of lines up. Uh, and we'll also discuss some scenarios and common cases where we see people who might find themselves eligible based on their immigration status. But uh, I want to make sure that this disclaimer is known right up front that the only and best way for someone to find out if they qualify for health insurance uh, is applying directly through access.wi.gov for the state Medicaid programs or healthcare.gov for the health insurance marketplace. And it will only be once they actually submit a full application that they will know if they qualify for these types of coverage. And as I mentioned, we will focus on Medicaid and marketplace eligibility. There are other types of insurance that might be offered to these individuals and families, like health insurance through an employer, uh, Medicare. Um, there might be uh, uh, essentially individual insurance that they can buy outside of the marketplace. We will not be discussing those options, but I want to make sure that you are aware that these exist, uh, that there are resources that will help uh, with those types of coverage. For example, covering with stuff, and we have our affordability worksheet to find out if employer coverage is considered affordable for a family or, or whether or not they would be able to go to the marketplace for financial assistance. We also have our health insurance options sheet that walks through kind of the different types of coverage and kind of what you need to consider first before you even get to Badger Care Plus and the marketplace for a consumer. And so these are the main takeaways of today's presentation. We will discuss types of immigrant status and households. And not households in the way you're thinking of households. We're not really talking about household size, but different household uh, makeup uh, regarding immigrant status. We'll be talking about Medicaid eligibility for the immigrant community, health insurance marketplace eligibility for the immigrant community. We'll briefly discuss the public charge rule, because I know that's a hot topic. Uh, we'll talk common case scenarios, and then I'll also mention a few resources that you might find useful in the future. So to start, we'll discuss types of immigrant status and households. So 
each program, Medicaid and the health insurance marketplace, have different ways that they define um, an eligible immigrant. So on Medicaid, we have people who are U.S. citizens or qualifying immigrants. And for the health insurance marketplace, they use the language a U.S. citizen or national or be lawfully present. And if you just take a look at these terms, that's not really telling you much. So what we're going to talk about is what does that really mean for each uh, program. So for Medicaid programs, uh, U.S. citizen or qualifying immigrants can qualify for these programs. Um, no, I'm not talking about emergency services or prenatal services on this slide, but we will talk about those programs. But what they're looking for in terms of eligible immigrant status, most commonly are U.S. citizens, children, pregnant women, and adults, refugees and asylees, children, pregnant women, and adults, permanent residents, uh, children, pregnant women, and adults who have permanently, or I'm sorry, who have been permanent residents for five years. So uh, the five-year rule is kind of important when you're talking about permanent residents uh, because that will come up uh, later in our presentation, and this can be a barrier uh, for an individual who technically has a qualifying immigrant status, but because of the time limit is not met, they do not qualify for Medicaid. So really, we're talking about children, pregnant women, and adults who have been here for five years. Children and pregnant women do not have the five-year waiting period applied to them. Uh, adults do. And, um, and so that's, that's an important uh, factor to keep in mind. Uh, but that does not mean that they do not qualify for any type of health insurance, which we will discuss further along. One thing to, to keep in mind as well is that these listed here are the most common statuses that we probably see for Medicaid eligibility. There are other types that can, people that can qualify for Medicaid programs, um, particularly um, people that um, are in the country due to uh, some kind of trafficking, um, whether it's uh, sex trafficking or drug trafficking. Um, domestic violence is another way that someone may qualify for Medicaid. Um, and uh, folks that are Native American, uh, but they are from Canada, but they're technically Native American uh, from tribes here in the U.S. Those are other less common options that we see. And so I do recommend that you list or you, or you look uh, in the Badger Care Handbook, the Medicaid Handbook, to see what the other various options are. I'm focusing on the most common ones because we still get mixed up even with the most common statuses. But please know this is not uh, a complete list. And if you would like that resource to figure out how to get there uh, through the handbook, I can send this along with the uh, archived presentation. For immigrant populations who do not qualify for the traditional Medicaid programs due to immigration status, they actually can get some type of coverage through Badger Care. Uh, first and foremost, women who are pregnant and do not qualify for traditional Badger Care Plus can get Badger Care Plus prenatal, of course, if they qualify for the other uh, requirements. But based on immigration status, if they are undocumented, um, if they uh, have not been here for five years but have their permanent residency, they would be eligible for Badger Care Plus prenatal if they were pregnant. There's also emergency services. Uh, and that is available to most immigrants who do not qualify for traditional Medicaid. Uh, we will talk a little more in depth uh, at a later slide about emergency services in particular. And then when it comes to immigrant status for the marketplace, uh, they define it as a U.S. citizen or national or be lawfully present. And that can mean a whole lot. And for the marketplace, it actually does. Uh, Marketplace coverage essentially accepts all statuses except for two major statuses. Uh, immigrants who are considered undocumented do not qualify for marketplace coverage, and people who, are, who qualify under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or also known as DACA, or the DREAMer program, uh, do not qualify for 
health insurance through the marketplace. So really, the best way to define immigration status for the marketplace is what um, immigration status do they not cover? And these are the two major ones that are not covered. Um, I linked a list to healthcare.gov that shows all of the statuses that they accept. Um, I also linked to uh, all the documents that they accept for verification because this is really my rule of thumb is that if a status can be verified, a person is most likely eligible for the marketplace. Uh, with the only exception is technically someone who has DACA status can uh, have some verification, which we will talk about, uh, but they unfortunately do not qualify for the marketplace coverage. And when we had the modified adjusted gross income presentation um, several months ago, we talked about household size and why it matters. And household size matters because it's how people find out what they qualify for in terms of Badger Care Plus eligibility and financial assistance in the health insurance marketplace. But beyond the average person who qualifies for these programs, household also matters for the immigration family. Um, or a family of immigrants because of immigration status. And each person may qualify for a different health insurance option, but in families of immigrants, they also may be impacted by um, the fact that some family members may qualify for coverage and some might not be eligible at all. And so these are what we consider mixed immigration status families, uh, a mixed immigration household, um, and, and this is, more common than most may think. So now we're gonna get into Medicaid eligibility for the immigrant community. So I know that we talked about this slide already and I just wanna make sure that you are, are familiar with the kind of um, statuses that we're talking about as it pertains to the Medicaid program. Uh, so US citizens, refugees and asylees, and there's no wait period for U.S. citizens or refugee and asylees for children, pregnant women, or adults. And then permanent residents, children and pregnant women have no wait period, but adults do have that five-year wait period. Badger Care Plus is health insurance for low-income men, women, pregnant women, and children in Wisconsin. And then there's Medicaid for the elderly, blind, or disabled which is health insurance for low-income people who are 65 or older, blind, or disabled. Um, so when I'm talking about traditional Medicaid programs, these are the programs that I'm talking about. Uh, these are the programs that uh, the, quali the def defined qualifying immigrants uh, can apply for and potentially uh, qualify for as long as other eligibility factors are in place beyond their immigration status. Children who are born in the U.S. can be eligible for health insurance even if their parents are not eligible. So this kind of goes back to that mixed immigration status family. Um, what we commonly see are parents who may be undocumented or may be in that five-year waiting period with their permanent residency, but children who are U.S. born or permanent residents who do not have that waiting period, they can apply for Badger Care Plus um, and their parents can be on their case, they just won't qualify for the health insurance. They won't be applying for those benefits. Um, and so that's important to know, especially because uh, right now we're in a time where a lot of folks are weary of signing up for benefits because of um, political climate, uh, different rules that might be changing, and one thing that is certain is that U.S. born children are eligible for health insurance. And even if parents are not eligible, they can apply for their children to sign up for those programs. So the Medicaid programs that are not, or are for non-qualifying immigrants, as defined on those previous slides, um, there are two major ones, Badger Care Plus Prenatal, which is health insurance for pregnant women who do not qualify for traditional Medicaid programs, Badger Care Plus, due to immigration status. So 
a woman who is in that five-year waiting period for her permanent residency, um, a, a woman who is undocumented, uh, a woman, frankly, with any other status beyond permanent residency beyond five years, a uh, U.S. citizen, refugee, or asylee can qualify for <clears throat> Badger Care plus prenatal uh, as long as the other eligibility factors are taken into consideration. Uh, and, and this is a resource that is available um, for, for many women who um, are, are pregnant and are going to have U.S. born children. The other program that is commonly used for folks that do not qualify for traditional Medicaid programs is emergency services. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy, but emergency services is a short-term health care, or is, I'm sorry, a short-term health care for children, parent caretakers, children aging out of foster care, pregnant women, and adults 65 or older who have an emergency condition who do not qualify for traditional Medicaid due to immigration status. I listed a kind of a, a more awkward list of potentially eligible individuals uh, because one outlying group is not included in emergency services. Childless adults do not qualify for emergency services. And this is a question that I see quite a lot come up. So when Wisconsin, uh, when we chose not to expand Medicaid, um, but still uh, allow for childless adults to qualify under the traditional Badger Care Plus and Medicaid programs up to 100% of the federal poverty level. We did not expand that level for emergency services. There was no requirement for our state to do so. And so we ended up um, maintaining the eligibility as it stood uh, prior to the changes to the eligibility level for Badger Care Plus. So this is um, important to know, important to be aware of, uh, because um, there are individuals who do not have dependent children uh, that may find themselves in an emergency and they will not qualify for emergency services. Um, it will have to be, uh, you know, through the free clinics, health centers, or community health centers, and the larger health systems uh, to determine how they will help those individuals uh, pay for services um, if they're not able to, to cover the cost. And one thing that is important, oh, I'm sorry, one thing that is important with emergency services is that it's based on uh, either the emergency condition or event, and it is uh, determined by the medical provider sending uh, their uh, concerns about the emergency condition to the fiscal agency that's contracted through the Medicaid program uh, to determine the length uh, and uh, type of services that the individual will uh, qualify for for that emergency. And so there are some cases where it's a one standalone incident um, that, that is impacting the individual and then there's other circumstances where it's a long-term emergency condition that if not treated could result in the person's um, uh, unfortunate death or uh, uh, loss of limb or some other long-term impacting condition. So it's not that we're talking about one particular event, but it will be determined by the medical provider seeing that patient along with the fiscal agency working for the Department of Health Services. So it's not, it's, there's no real steadfast law or rule that defines the emergency. It, I mean, there is a rule, let me back up. There is a rule that defines an emergency, but it's not, um, it, there's uh, different ways to look at these emergencies as they in, impact the individual for eligibility. All right, I, I wanna pause just for a moment. Were there any questions on the first part of the presentation that you wanna include in the chat box? Is there anything that you wanted me to address regarding Medicaid in particular uh, for the immigrant community?
All right, seeing no comments in the chat box, I'll, I'll leave those questions for later on. And we'll get to the next section, which is health insurance marketplace eligibility for the immigrant community. So as I mentioned, the marketplace uh, can feel almost like a catch-all for other types of immigrant statuses. Uh, immigrants who are considered undocumented and people who qualify under the Deferred Action for Child Foot Arrivals, DACA, are really the only uh, two statuses that do not qualify for marketplace eligibility. Uh, and so that is, um, that leaves eligibility open to a lot of other different uh, categories of immigration statuses. For example, folks with student visas, uh, folks who are um, are here with a work permit, um, folks who are uh, here um, wow, I'm like looking on on the list. There's a lot. <laughs> um, and so I do recommend going to that link that shows all the statuses because there's there is actually quite a, a long list of statuses that people may be eligible for, uh, for marketplace coverage while they're in the country, whether it's temporarily or permanently. And marketplace tax credit eligibility or the financial assistance that's tied into the health insurance marketplace is for everyone between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level. But I want you to mark this uh, specific uh, difference for the immigrant community. Immigrants in the five-year wait period or um, whose immigration status does not allow them to qualify for Medicaid can also get marketplace coverage. Uh, so the idea was the Affordable Care Act <clears throat> was to expand Medicaid in all 50 states. And that would allow for um, anyone under 133, with the disregard to 138% of the federal poverty level, to qualify for uh, the state's Medicaid program. Um, that would still leave out immigrants that otherwise would not qualify for those programs. So folks that are on a five-year wait period and the statuses that do not qualify for state Medicaid. So with that, under the ACA, they also then expanded eligibility for uh, these statuses that do not qualify for Medicaid, uh, where they would be able to get marketplace coverage and also get financial assistance, even though they're below 100% of the federal poverty level. And so this is really important uh, because um, a lot of folks they see someone who doesn't qualify for Medicaid due to immigration status. Uh, they may have got a denial notice saying, you know, you don't qualify because uh, you're still within the five year wait period, for example, for permanent residence. Um, so this is key to then recognize that that individual could still get marketplace coverage. Um, I'm putting on the screen right now the question that is really crucial when you're uh, in the marketplace application uh, to check correctly so that you are uh, processing the application for tax credits, even if their income is below 100% FTL. So when it's asking, were any of these people denied coverage through VegaCare Plus uh, through these programs due to their immigration status in the last four years, you would check the box for that consumer and then it asks you again, was this person found not eligible by their state because of their immigration status? When you select yes, it is allowing for the marketplace application to uh, disregard Medicaid for that individual and allow them to uh, sign up for marketplace coverage and process if they are eligible for financial assistance, even if their income is technically below that limit.
Also, we know that the health insurance marketplace, or really under the Affordable Care Act, uh, it was a requirement to have health insurance. Uh, the tax penalty does not apply starting in 2019, but one of those exemptions uh, for immigrants in particular were the folks that do not qualify for any type of insurance. So really looking at the folks that are under DACA or folks that are considered undocumented, um, they would qualify for an exemption. They were never required to pay a penalty for not having health insurance themselves. Uh, if they have US born children, or family members that are within their tax filing household that do qualify for health insurance, but they did not have health insurance, they would still have to pay a penalty for those individuals, but not for themselves. And then for special enrollment periods, there are uh, a few, well, one in particular uh, special enrollment event that can uh, impact immigrants. Uh, one in particular is immigration status change. If someone becomes newly eligible, uh, either they uh, became citizens or they became lawfully present in the US, they have a 60 day window to enroll in the marketplace. And this is actually a common one that I see, especially for new uh, immigrants that maybe um, were waiting uh, to come to the US for their uh, new status to kick in. And um, one of the first things that they do is they talk to part or people in their community that um, have health insurance coverage or have been assisted by one of our enrollment assisters. And then they get referred to us uh, because they want to know if they qualify for insurance. And if it's within 60 days, uh, so 60 days of either the date on the card of whatever that new documentation is. Um, so whenever they were uh, processed as eligible or processed for that new status, or the day they received that documentation. Um, so you can use whatever is um, within that 60 day period, because I have had where people have a green card uh, processing, it's coming in the mail, they know it'll arrive soon, but it's for a, a date that has already passed the 60 day window, they just haven't received it in hand. When they receive it in the mail, you can use the letter that uh, it comes with it that is dated usually a little later because it's whenever it was sent with um, the card. You can use that date to process a marketplace application. And I've seen both go through, and really the key is having proper proof of verification when submitting the application. So I see that there's some questions in the chat box, and so I'm gonna see if I can address a couple of them before we move forward. Um, and if there's any questions regarding marketplace eligibility um, and the different things that we've discussed, please feel free to add them along. I'll see if I can address a few now, and then if need be, um, I will, uh, address some of them at the end. Yeah, so uh, Patricia, thank you for your question. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that in the next se session, or I'm sorry, the next section. Uh, but she was told that, a, she was told by a pregnant mother that her lawyer advised her against applying for Title 19 or any Medicaid program because if she applied, it would hinder her immigration status. Um, and that has a lot to do with kind of the political environment um, and rule changes uh, specifically tied to the public charge, which we will discuss uh, very briefly. But um, this is something very common that we're seeing is that uh, immigration lawyers that are working with individuals that want to uh, eventually become permanent residents or want to become US citizens, um, they are, uh, telling their, their clients that they should not accept any public benefits. And uh, there is some rhyme and reason to that. Uh, there are some precautionary concerns that these individuals and families need to consider. And it is, at the end of the day, the choice of that individual. What we can do best, and one of the reasons why this presentation was even prompted, is we can at least let them know 
what they are eligible for. And at this point in time, they are eligible for uh, the prenatal program, the health insurance um, through uh, marketplace, potentially eligible for the Medicaid programs. Um, and so it's important for us to at least let them know that these are options. Uh, one thing that we cannot tell them because we are not legal professionals is whether or not it will impact their ability to become you know, permanent residents in the future. Uh, they do have to listen to you know, the, the, the advice from their legal professionals, but what we can do is at least give them the options that they have available to them and make sure that um, they are the ones making that final decision. Not their lawyers, not us, but the consumer uh, at hand. Um, because it's it's for their own livelihood, it's for the livelihood of their families, it's for the livelihood of their children. Uh, and we'll we'll discuss this kind of in the next section. Um, <clears throat> so then, uh, Angela, you asked, how is it determined when requesting emergency Medicaid for undocumented aliens? Uh, if it's a single occurrence versus longer term coverage for an individual that comes into a hospital multiple times over the course of, say, six months for life threatening health conditions. Um, I have been assisting the same patient who is over the age of 65 who has come into the facility numerous times and have been admitted, but for every instance she's admitted, she has not been approved for alien emergency Medicaid. Um, and that's a great question. And I think uh, because it, you know, it can be unique to each situation, um, it's important that uh, the provider that's seeing her um, is submitting the proper documentation. Um, and I can link uh, to the handbook page uh, on the Medicaid handbook uh, that discusses uh, essentially showing verification for emergency Medicaid um, because I think it's a matter of making sure that the fiscal agent is getting all of the story or history of the patient and um, it's showing essentially showing the urgency of that condition and what the ramifications are for that individual if they do not get these services um, treated. And so, um, yeah, if this is something that you and I want to talk about offline, I'd be happy to do so. All right, and then I'll take one more. Uh, will the patient actually need to apply with Medicaid for actual denial, or can it be answered yes as, uh, as denied as they know that they are not over the five, year, five years yet and Medicaid ineligible? Um, I'm guessing this is for the health insurance marketplace question uh, regarding uh, folks that would not qualify for Medicaid um, when they're applying for tax credits below 100% of the federal poverty level. Um, so technically, um, in the application, it does state that they, um, uh, no, actually, I'll go back to that so I'm getting the words right. It says, check the box only if a person was found not eligible for this coverage by their state, not by the marketplace. The way I have interpreted that language is that um, you can check the box if you know for sure that if they were to apply for Medicaid based on the rules of Medicaid, they would not qualify. Not because the marketplace is, and this would be if you submitted the marketplace application and, and it says so-and-so is not eligible for Medicaid, it could be that you typed in something wrong and they based on other eligibility could be eligible for marketplace. But because we know the rules uh, for Medicaid eligibility for the immigrant community, uh, we can just check that box and um, continue on with the application. Uh, I would not go through the rigmarole of applying to access, getting them a denial, even though you know that they're going to be denied, and then going back to the marketplace. That's um, in, in, um, inefficiency for uh, for you, it's not helpful to the patient at hand or the consumer at hand, and it's just going to uh, elongate the process when we could be getting them coverage right away. Okay, so I'll leave, or looks like we have a couple more, or we have one more, but I'll leave that one uh, for a little later. Thank you for your patience. All right, 
So now we're going to get into the public charge and um, other immigrant regulations. Uh, so for the purpose of this webinar, I wanted to talk about public charge and I wanted to define it the best way I thought possible. Uh, but please know I'm not a legal professional. There is a lot of conversation happening right now about this uh, definition. And so this is really just to get us to a point where we can talk about it as a group. So the way I'm defining it is public charge is defined as someone who is likely to become dependent on the government for basic needs. Uh, and specifically by way of being enrolled in certain public benefits. So if someone is considered a public charge by the Office of uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, this can impact their future eligibility for uh, gaining a qualifying immigrant status, gaining permanent residency, or becoming a US citizen. So, so that's kind of our, our loose definition. Um, when we're talking about public charge though, the reason that it's such a hot topic right now, because this has always been in place, um, is that just last, at the end of last year, uh, the federal government came out with a proposed change to what programs are considered under the public charge rules um, to determine someone who uh, is a, a public charge on the federal government or the government at large. <clears throat> so before, well currently, the programs that are included in this definition are cash assistance programs like TANF or Wisconsin Works, programs for long-term care. Uh, for example, if someone um, uh, essentially has a long-term um, hospital stay that is beyond what's considered rehabilitative, that could be also defined as someone being a public charge. Um, and then supp uh, supplemental security income, or SSI, uh, are the, the main uh, programs under public charge that could impact someone who is trying to become a permanent resident or a US citizen in the future. What was changed in the proposed rule uh, is that they started to include other programs that current immigrant populations may actually be eligible for, uh, like non-emergency Medicaid, which would be Badger Care Plus, Medicare Part B uh, for low-income folks, so the uh, prescription subsidy program, food share, and then several housing programs are also included. And so one thing that we have seen just from the proposal of these changes are folks talking to immigration lawyers and being um, guided to either disenroll or not enroll in certain programs. Um, we've seen programs that aren't even listed impacted like WIC. Uh, we've seen, heard a lot of people not enrolling in WIC. Um, we've heard of uh, families not enrolling their US born children into certain programs because they also think it might impact uh, their likelihood of gaining a lawful status. Um, and there's a lot of fear behind it too because we've also heard of increases in deportation, um, you know, raids at, at, at different um, workplaces. Uh, and, and this just puts a community at, on edge. Um, if this is the difference between gaining services that may help your basic needs uh, versus separating your family, it really puts someone between a rock and a hard place. And so um, this is not an in-depth review of the public charge. Uh, this is really meant to just educate you basically on uh, what is going on and what some concerns are beyond um, essentially our expertise as enrollment assisters. But I do want to emphasize that right now, the rule is not final. Uh, there's no way to know what will be included in the final version of the rule because there has been, uh, there were thousands of comments that were submitted to the federal government and they do have to review every single comment that was submitted. That is one of the reasons why we do not have a final rule published at this time. And once we know what is final, we'll have a better grasp of what we should be telling consumers. Um, one thing that I do recommend is to read up on this issue. Uh, I want um, 
I want you to at least feel that you have a, a decent grasp on what it pertains. And please know that we can only tell folks uh, what they're eligible for at this point in time. And it is their decision at the end of the day, once hearing our thoughts and thoughts uh, and advice from any legal professional they're working with to determine what they think is best for their families. To continue learning on this issue, uh, the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association, or WIPCA, uh, is working with Covering Wisconsin. We're putting together a plain language document to help our community partners understand more about the public charge and other uh, immigration rules that may be impacting uh, the choice of families to enroll in these programs. On May 9th, we'll actually be doing a follow-up webinar to this one on the intersection of immigration and public benefits. And this will be in collaboration with WITCA and then um, End Domestic Violence uh, of Wisconsin, Legal Action of Wisconsin, and a couple other uh, key partners uh, that have that legal expertise. So please watch out. Uh, we'll be doing a registration soon once we can get um, everything confirmed for that day. Any other questions about um, public charge? Um, I won't get to them just this moment, but I want to make sure that you guys are, are plugging them away in the chat box and I can address them at the end of the session. And if I can't address them, um, I can take any public charge related questions uh, back to our partners uh, who are collaborating for that webinar and we can make sure that they're addressed on that main line date. All right. So now that we've gone through Medicaid eligibility, marketplace eligibility, we've discussed kind of some nuances between um, enrolling in these programs and how different statuses may be eligible. I'm gonna put you all to the test. So if you are using the chat box feature, I'm hoping that you will uh, humor me with some interaction in this webinar as we go through a couple case scenarios. So let's start off easy. We have a student, uh, Muhammad, who is 19, is a student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He has a student visa. What health insurance program might he qualify for? I'll wait till I get at least a couple responses. Be brave. We're all learning here, so don't, don't worry. Interesting. Okay, so I am getting mostly marketplace. A couple of folks are thinking Title 19, and a few have mentioned emergency services. Okay, so let's see. Oh, nice. And someone actually mentioned insurance coverage from the university offered to international students. Okay, touche. Hi, May. That's like uh, 301. <laughs> level responses. Um, but either way, uh, Muhammad would not qualify for Medicaid programs because uh, one, traditional Medicaid programs, uh, student visas are not considered a qualifying immigrant status for Medicaid. Uh, emergency services, he would also not qualify for uh, because um, and I didn't say whether or not he had children, but we're assuming he does not have children um, or at least uh, dependent children as he is an international student. Um, so he would not qualify for emergency services either. In this scenario, really the only thing that he would qualify for would be the health insurance marketplace. And only if we make sure that we're checking that box uh, on the question of was he, uh, were any of the individuals denied coverage due to their immigration status in the last four years. And that would allow us to then process him for uh, coverage with financial assistance in the marketplace. And then someone is asking, would he need to wait for open enrollment to qualify for marketplace? Um, that's a great question, Jose. And it's a yes and no. 
So if he is a brand new student who just entered the country and just received his new, you know, student visa because he's starting, um, let's say this is, you know, in the fall and he comes in uh, in August to start his semester at the end of the month, uh, we would actually be able to uh, qualify him for a special enrollment period at that time using the documentation that's available for his visa and the date that uh, he received that status. And that would be a 60-day window when he enters the country. And so this would be a great opportunity to maybe partner with local universities um, who are getting new students, new international students, and make sure that they are aware of the assistance that we could be providing new students who otherwise would not have health insurance. Um, there may be an international student um, a service or, or insurance that's available. Um, but at the same time, this is a, a viable option for them, and it'd be best for the student to know what other options are available before they just select what is all they know through the school. All right. So this one's a little tough. We're, 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 first one was 101. Now we're getting into a 201 level question. So uh, Natalie is a permanent resident, she's 32, is a permanent resident of the U.S. and has two children, Roberto and Oscar, uh, who are four and one. Roberto is also a permanent resident of the U.S. and Oscar is a U.S. citizen because he was born in Wisconsin. Natalie and Roberto are, uh, have been permanent residents for three years. What health insurance program might each member qualify for? So <clears throat> let's start with Natalie. What what do you all think she would qualify for? Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. So most of you are on on the money. So for Nat Natalie, uh, she would be eligible for Marketplace. It would still be the five-year wait period because she is an adult, and so we would have to answer that same question for her in the Marketplace application so that we were looking at um, financial assistance and that she was not being processed for, uh, for Marketplace. Oh, I'm sorry, for Medicaid. Um, and this question uh, is just best if you know that they're in that five-year wait period, even if their income is over that limit, it's just kind of a safe uh, bet to answer that question appropriately to make sure that they're not sent for any reason. Um, because it, it can be a little fuzzy if we know uh, that they're right on the cusp and you know, in any other circumstance, maybe Natalie would be gap filling eligible. We don't even wanna go there because we know that based on Wisconsin law, there's the five-year wait period and she just would not be eligible for the program whatsoever. So rather than waste her time having to go through a, a Medicaid denial, let's just get her on the coverage we know is right for her and then um, her children would be eligible for Medicaid, which a lot of you have already said. So since Roberto is a permanent resident under the age of 19, the five-year wait period does not apply to him and he would be eligible for Badger Care or the Marketplace, depending on the household income and size and everything like that. Oscar, because he is a U.S. citizen, would be eligible for Badger Care in the Marketplace as well. Wonderful. You guys are doing great. So then finally, our last family. Francis and Vanessa are married and are undocumented immigrants. They have three children, Samuel, who is 20, Monica, who is, did I say 11? Sorry, um, 16, sorry, 16, and Eddie, who is nine. Monica and Eddie are US citizens. Samuel has a work permit and a social security number through the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. What health insurance program might each a family member qualify for? I'll wait for some of your responses. Okay, so I'm seeing Samuel, emergency services. 
parents emergency services. Don't be shy. I know this one's tough. <laughs> Oh, no AE for Samuel. Never mind. <laughs> you guys are correcting your responses. Let's see. Francis and Vanessa, only emergency services. Samuel, emergency, and Monica and Eddie, Medicaid or Marketplace. Okay, do you have your final answers locked in? Well, thank you all for your participation. This makes this more fun for me. <laughs> all right, so. The final answer, Francis and Vanessa would not be eligible for traditional Medicaid programs or the marketplace, but since they have minor children in their household, they both would qualify for emergency services during an emergency, and if Vanessa were pregnant, she would qualify for Badger Care Plus prenatal. Samuel, on the other hand, has a work permit and a social security number, which on their own would qualify him for marketplace, but since these documents are through the DACA program, he does not qualify for traditional Medicaid or marketplace coverage. Uh, he would also not qualify for emergency services because this program is not expanded to childless adults. And because he's 20, he's considered a childless adult. Samuel would be able to seek care at a safety net health center or clinic, and that would really be Samuel's major options in terms of um, health, in, well, not health insurance, but health care. And then Monica and Eddie, the children, would qualify for Badger Care Plus or the marketplace. Even though their parents are undocumented, they would have the right to apply to either program as U.S. citizens, and the household information would only be used to determine the eligibility of health insurance. So this is important to note, um, both uh, the Badger Care Plus Medicaid programs and the health insurance marketplace do not share information to immigration. Um, the only thing that they are determining for is health insurance coverage for the family and folks that are undocumented do not need, they do not need to share um, their social security numbers, especially if they don't have any, um, if they're not applying for services or coverage themselves. It's only for the individuals that are applying for those programs. And so they can still be within the household on the application, they just would not be seeking services. All right, so now we're just gonna run through a couple of resources. Uh, Covering Wisconsin has a how-to sheet for en uh, enrollment assisters, community partners on undocumented immigrants. So what we have put together is a resource that has all-in-one um, items to help you understand emergency services and kind of when to apply or how to apply for a consumer, uh, information about free clinics and community health centers, and then the prenatal service program for pregnant women. And this is just a nice how-to uh, resource to have at your fingertips when you encounter individuals that might be uh, eligible for these programs that otherwise are not eligible for traditional Medicaid or the health insurance marketplace. Another thing that I would really recommend you have either saved in your bookmarks or um, you request, I think, through two-on-one uh, hard copy uh, is the Milwaukee County Safety Net Clinic directory. The Milwaukee Healthcare Partnership has put together a wonderful resource that has all of the free and charitable clinics and the uh, community health centers or federally qualified health centers uh, that are available in our county that can provide services to anyone, regardless of immigrant status, uh, insurance status, uh, and can help them uh, identify primary health care homes, uh, dental care, and specialty access, uh, even if they are uninsured. And please note, everything in this presentation, if I show an image, if I have a, you know, a resource, it's all linked. So when you get this hard copy of the slide, you will have all of these resources available to you. So I really would recommend going through the slides and making sure that you are familiar with these different tools. 
And then finally, I please ask you to complete the evaluation because this helps me improve the presentations for you. Uh, it also allows uh, me to hit on topics that are uh, important to your work and are, uh, are helping you essentially provide better service. So uh, if you could take a few minutes after this presentation to complete the survey, the link is in the presentation. Um, I will also um, put it in the chat box and it will also be available uh, in your email shortly after the presentation. And now we'll just go back and finish up some questions. So please, if you have a question, throw it in there and then I'll, uh, I'll try to address it. I'm gonna go back to the top because I know there was one question that I didn't get to before we had our case scenario. <laughs> All right, so Claire asks, what if a child who is US born and have undocumented parents who are currently out of the country and unreachable and is living with other relatives in a safe place, can that, can that relative apply for the child? The child is a homeless, unaccompanied youth at this time. Um, absolutely, that's a great question. So if they're living in a household where um, they're living with uh, relatives, uh, they can apply for uh, Badger Care, Medicaid, um, with their caretaker, essentially parent or caretaker, um, on the head of household of the application, and um, they would be applying for that child on behalf of, of, of the child. And it doesn't need to be their parents who are not living in the country, for example. Um, and depending on the age of the child, if, if it's a older teenager, there are some circumstances too where the child would be able to apply on their own as a homeless youth. Um, so, so both scenarios are possible. And so I would really recommend that you um, uh, work with the local Badger Care Office through Miles, uh, apply through Access. If you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or to reach out to our partners at the Department of Health Services. Great questions, guys. You guys came up with some really good questions. And finally, I think there was a few at the bottom. Let me get down to there. Yes, I think this is more of a comment, but yes, um, it is surprising to see that uh, undocumented members who have um, children uh, in the household could get emergency services, but then the individual who is um, here with uh, uh, DACA status do not qualify because their child was adults. And um, this is, I wanted to make sure that that type of example was present because that is probably a very common case uh, because uh, if you are not familiar with why certain individuals qualify for DACA status, it is because they were brought to the country as children as undocumented children by their parents because you go where your parents tell you to go. You don't have a choice of, you know, stay in this country or go to this country. Um, and so they were brought to the country without their awareness of being undocumented or not. Um, and so they get essentially this temporary protection. Um, but because this was, um, not a full law that was passed through Congress. It was an executive order under the President Obama administration. Um, there was a lot of services that weren't included in this protected status. So even though they have a work permit, they have a social security number, um, they are not eligible for many programs, um, including healthcare, housing, um, just really the list goes on. Uh, and so I'm glad that you found that helpful. Uh, and then Rhonda, I saw your question in registration as well. Um, and so I, I thank you for that question. And I know that, um, I, I feel like I can't do that question quite justice. She's asking about immigrants who arrived before uh, August 22nd, uh, 1996, which is where um, Some is a cutoff for continuously present um, immigrants uh, based on a law that was passed 
um, in, I want to say in the late 80s, uh, folks who have been present, uh, even if they were undocumented, could uh, eventually qualify for uh, permanent residency and eventually then citizenship. Um, but I don't know the ins and outs of their eligibility. I know that there are some different structures or the wait periods don't necessarily apply. But I, I want to make sure I do that justice. So um, I will hold off and I will see if I can answer that question after the fact and include that in the follow-up email with the presentation slides. So thank you for addressing it and hopefully I'll have a better answer for you shortly. And then uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, if a student or student spouse has university coverage for international students and the coverage does not include prenatal care, would you be eligible for Badger Care prenatal? Great question. Um, and my understanding is yes. Uh, so if they have coverage but it does not cover prenatal, um, and I think too, even if it covers prenatal, um, they would still be able to seek eligibility for the prenatal program uh, because they, the, the mom does not qualify for traditional Medicaid, uh, but they would be able to at least uh, apply for the Badger Care prenatal with their non-qualifying immigration status. Um, also, they would be able to look at uh, marketplace eligibility as well, uh, depending on their circumstances and other, other factors of eligibility. Wonderful. Well, I think we came up to the end of the presentation and the end of questions. So I thank you all for participating on today's webinar. Uh, this one was tough <laughs> and tough in that it uh, is a really hot topic right now. There's a lot of uh, concern around this issue because a lot of folks are scared and worried. And I wanted to make sure that um, we were addressing, uh, at least in the area that we can provide um, secure answers for around health insurance um, to the folks that are asking these questions of whether or not they should enroll their families in these programs. And based on eligibility, many immigrants are eligible for some type of health insurance. Um, and then I'm hoping that we'll be able to answer more questions on that May 9th webinar uh, regarding what that means uh, to be eligible, uh, but then have the underlying immigration rules um, kind of hovering over the family's head. So uh, please, if there's other questions, don't hesitate. I hope that uh, this was informative and please complete the evaluation because it lets me do a better job moving forward. Thank you very much.